Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day. I'm going well myself and we are edging closer to spring. Just recently we had solar panels installed on our studio Garden of Yoga and now I've developed a habit of checking how much power we've generated every five minutes. It's nearly an obsession but seriously we've got two split systems in our studio and it is actually quite scary how much power they draw so it makes me feel a little bit better just knowing that during the daytime at least we are supplementing if not generating all the power that we're using there so that's good and it makes me wonder why as a society we aren't using solar more in general I know there's many problems and issues but it's like free power raining down from the sky right anyway enough soapboxing from me let's get on to our episode this week we're featuring a recorded conversation between myself co-host Joe Stewart and Gabrielle Boswell Gabrielle is a yoga teacher, a yoga therapist, and director of the Bhava Yoga and Dance Centre in Warrandyke, Victoria, Australia. She's a highly respected teacher, and I got to know her just a little bit better through satsangs I've attended, run by Lee Blaschke and Janet Lowndes. She has a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and always contributes with her many deep insights to the satsang, so I really wanted to chat with her for the podcast. Now, this isn't an official Yoga Australia episode, but it just happens that Gabrielle also sits on their board, which I didn't even know when we recorded this interview. Now, we'll catch up with Gabrielle soon, but before we do, I just want to let you know about what we have going on at our studio, Garden of Yoga. On Thursday the 5th and the 12th of September at 6pm, I'll be leading a couple of donation-based classes to help raise money for No Stomach for Cancer. As some of you may be aware, about four years ago, I was diagnosed with stomach cancer and later on that year, my stomach has removed. All right, my cat has just gotten up on the table right in front of me. I really feel that yoga and meditation helped me get through that whole time. So I'll be sharing a little bit about my story and we'll be indulging in some pranayama, gentle movement and deep meditation that should soothe the mind and maybe even help the digestive system a little bit. These sessions are really important to me, so I hope you can make it along. I'll leave a link to the show notes on our website, podcast.floatartist.com. All right, that's more than enough from me. Let's get on to the conversation with Gabrielle. All right, well, hi, Gabrielle. So good to have you here today. Perhaps we could just start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and where you grew up. Okay, cool. Thanks for having me. I grew up in the eastern suburbs and pretty much all of my life I've lived in that area, so born and bred in Melbourne. Through my school years, I was really interested in physical education, so movement has always been something I've been passionate about. As I moved into my high school years, I became more and more interested in PE, dynamics of movement, was also really curious about the physical body. So biology and PE were subjects I did in my HSC and did pretty well at. And at high school too, I did some work experience at my primary school with the PE teacher there. And I just assumed that PE teachers at school would take you through ball sports and that kind of thing. But he was super passionate about encouraging movement in young children and helping them in learning and I thought that's something I'd be really interested in doing. So I started study as a PE teacher. I wanted to do primary school so I could get in there in the golden ages of learning and it was a time where they decided to cut back funding primary schools and they were cutting out all the specialist teachers so they cut back music and PE and I had no interest in being a general classroom teacher so I let that go and worked for probably 12 or 15 years in insurance. Oh, wow. wow, That's a big change. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I just kind of let that go. I was always doing a lot of sport myself. I played softball for many years, did calisthenics and gymnastics, but kind of put that whole teaching thing to the side. I thought, I guess that's not for me. And so did you just see the insurance job in the paper and is that why you went in that direction or was there another thing that drew you to it? No, I wasn't interested in the industry per se. Uh, I think I just went into what was an employment agency and uh, the skill set was pretty basic 
And I thought, great, it's a full-time job. It's a start. Data entry clerk is where I began and worked up through through the ranks to supervising and stuff and working ridiculously long hours. But yeah, really enjoyed the, the team components and a bit of puzzle solving and getting things done. And I did that right up to having my two boys. And just to roll back a bit, you mentioned you're inspired in school about physical movement. Was there a particular teacher that pushed you in that direction or, you know, guided you, encouraged you? Or was it just a gradual unfolding and love of of movement? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it was a combination of me being really enjoying moving my body. I loved it how I felt when I moved. I really enjoyed. I was in quite a bit of competitive sport, so I enjoyed that too. But certainly the teachers I found, because I was doing PE as a sport but also as as a subject, so getting more into it, once you got to year 11 and 12 and the teachers could see that you were passionate about it, you were treated in a different way. There was a respect for you and so they would talk to you more as an adult. So I think really there was three PE teachers who were there at my high school and I think all of them were equally encouraging and they were obviously passionate about what they were doing and that kind of naturally rubbed off, I think. So not anyone in particular, but I think you know the whole, the whole team really. And so when did you discover yoga? When I was working in insurance, I had a a friend there and her brother was an Iyengar teacher. And so I went along to a class and I thought, this is super hard. And it it felt very physical and it wasn't really my kind of thing. And so I let that go for a a long time. I then went years later to another Iyengar class, which is interesting. I went in that direction and I didn't really enjoy being in the classes, but I felt amazing afterwards. And that kind of kept bringing me back. And I did that for a while. And again, I stopped. And then what really lit my fire was when I was pregnant with my first son, Aiden, 22, 23 years ago, I did a prenatal video. And I did that every day. And I just felt amazing. And I think that's really what lit the fire for me. When I could, I found a a class in the area that I could go to. And initially, it wasn't strong enough for what I was used to. But it really touched me in a different way. And I remember being at home, I was, I'd left the insurance, I was at home looking after my, my boys and a newsletter came through and they were looking for yoga teachers. And I thought, I'm not working now. The boys are getting a bit older. You know, I need to get back into something. And I love yoga and it's something I can kind of fit into the hours of school and stuff. And I thought, I'll see. So I called up the lady and said, I'm really interested. Do I need any prerequisites or any experience? And she said, You simply need to be open to whatever it is that we're going to offer and have a love of yoga. And I thought, I've got that in space. Yeah. 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 So it all sort of began from there. And so what style was that that you did your training in? So the studio I did my training in is now the studio that is my studio, which is kind of a full circle. So it's um, Bahabi Yoga in Warrandyte. And it's, it's really is a boutique style of yoga so it's not under any particular lineage very much influenced by the Satchananda teachings but there's color and music and creativity and it's a very integrated style of yoga so there's we begin with a relaxation and then gentle movement and there's always a meditation at the end. Was there kind of a turning point maybe it was your pregnancy when things shifted from feeling like Oh, this practice is just not quite strong enough to be satisfying for me. Like I want to move in a different way yeah. to like settling into that more gentle practice. I was attending classes at Bahaba for a year before I got the notification about the teacher training. And it had taken me ages to find a class that worked with the kids. And, and so I went once a week, every week. And for the first couple of weeks, I was lying there thinking my body really wants more. I think having had the Iyengar experience, I wanted something stronger. But my heart was saying yes. And I remember lying down listening to these beautiful, creative visualizations and little tears coming down the side of my face. And they weren't tears of sadness. They were, it was like a coming home and a listening and a connecting in a different way. And I thought if I can help one person feel this way, that would be amazing. So it was just, I think it was just a feeling into connecting inwardly in a different way. And I still love feeling strong and doing other things. I do boot camp and a little bit of weight training and I love to feel strong in my body, but that's not why I do yoga. So just to backtrack again, did you have a little bit of dance in the mix as well? Yeah, nothing, nothing formal. I did a little bit with calisthenics. There's always like an element of mm-hmm. freeform dance in that. 
So at the, the yoga centre, so it's Bahava Yoga and Dance. So we do offer creative dance as well. And that is a natural extension, I think, of the yoga. So it's it's movement born from a sense of self. There'll be things that connect you more to grounding. There'll be things that connect you more to your heart, movements that connect you more to you know, the water center. And so it's, it's a natural extension of the yoga. And I think it very much informs how I sequence and bring a class together. All the classes are very fluid and transition, I think, beautifully. So you would naturally move from the ground to a a kneeling position to a standing position and then back down to a lower position so you're not up and down. I think the the flow of dance helps you find that rhythm and that grace in transition and that's a big part of what we offer at the centre is these beautiful smooth transitions so it's a moving meditation that from the moment you begin to, to end hopefully there's nothing that interrupts you from really being fully with yourself. And it's interesting you should mention that because I find for me those fluid transition, it's like you're always present yes. in the movement. And Iyengar is not my style either. Yep. Like, and one of the reasons why is that structure of the class of like, yep, stop and look at this thing. Yeah. Now we'll all go back and do it. I just felt like I was always losing focus. Because yeah. like, oh, wait, now we're doing this. Oh, okay. Now we're going back. And it really works for me as well to not have that separation of this is the pose that we're working towards and then this is a transition to get there. Like it's all the flow. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you're really there from, it's it's a never ending moment. As you mentioned, it's a very flowing style. And I'm just wondering how, how do you encourage that flowing smoothness in students who may be a little bit newer and may not have that physical literacy or ability to move as, as well as other people? How do you encourage that? Or do you even not go there? Or? I think a lot of it is is ideally as a teacher using the right invitational language um, and sometimes you know there's there's certainly structure around what I offer in terms of a practice or, or a posture but I love to give people opportunities if it feels appropriate to explore being in it in a particular way so if it feels like the arms want to move the arms can move or if it feels that you just want to be there and breathe then that's fine too my husband's just recently started coming and doing yoga with me which has been great And I felt that this sort of easy, fluid, just feel into your body was actually almost an easy way of practicing because it wasn't so rigid and it really gave you the invitation to kind of find your own way. But his take on it was that it's actually an advanced practice, Mm. that unless you have the framework, then it's very hard to know how to find those kind of edges. So that's been a good learning experience for me to bring that on board and think that that for people who are used to a much more specific way of practicing, that could be a little intimidating Mm. and a little challenging. But I think it's really that invitational language is important. So you feel into yourself and if it feels fun or if it feels interesting, then maybe this is possible. Mm. I just remembered a story of Joel, probably laugh at this one, but many years ago before I (laughs) uh, really practiced yoga, Joel was doing a Shiva Ray DVD and I was practicing along with her and she did... Was it psych- Swimming into infinity yeah, or something like yeah. that? Yeah, so it was very free movement <laughs> yeah. and, you know, sort of quite intense on the core as well. And I wasn't in the best shape at the time and I got a bit angry and, <laughs> and sort of gave up and, and might have refer to her as the antichrist for a while okay. after that but <laughs> so i hope the yoga world doesn't hate me for i think she will be okay with us yeah yeah, yeah. But my, my position's changed since yeah, then yeah we Hopefully. haven't picked up that dvd no, again, no. Like, let's we should try we should yes yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think too it's it would be unless it's that's your style i know for me it's something that i i throw in here and there but it's not what I would offer for a full class. So if a little bit of something isn't resonating, then hopefully something else is going to. I'd love to think that there's something within what I'm offering that really says yes. And you allow that sort of space for freedom of movement and exploration as well. That sounds great. Yeah. (laughs) I think as well, sometimes if everything is just flowing, people get that sense of what am I meant to be doing here Mm. where sometimes if it's sequence and you can very clearly what you're engaging what you're stretching you know maybe it's a sequence with a specific goal and sometimes people's minds can just like latch onto that really easily and I find as well if it's a sequence that's 
maybe not super enjoyable or comfortable. And I'm thinking of like mini Pilates sequences where it's like, I'm just doing this because it's really productive for my body. It's really good for me. And if it's feeling a little bit awkward, it's because I'm learning to move yeah. in a new way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of what I'm offering, and I, I like to incorporate some of the somatics into what I do too. I did some somatics training with Lisa Peterson uh, a few years back, and that very much does involve, there is a structure in it, so you really know what you're doing, but it really invites in a lovely fluid flow and uh, I feel at the beginning and the end of the class, I, I like to use a lot as a warm in and a warm out. And it does encourage that lovely sense of, of flow and openness, but the structure's still there too. And are you a teacher that pre-plans your class and thinks about what you're going to do? Or are you in that flow as you're teaching as well and just seeing how it all unfolds and how people are responding to things? It's really changed a lot over the years. I used to plan absolutely everything and I'd have my notes off to the side as kind of a backup and notice I really never went to them. And I found as time's gone on, particularly the last couple of years, I may find there's usually a seed or a couple of things that I want to explore, whether it's a theme or a few postures, but I tend to go in and it it kind of unfolds now more than anything. I would be quite confident to go in and just teach the class. I do teach in a bit of a format, so I kind of start on the ground and you know work my way up and work my way down. And you know, having taught for many years, there's a lot of postures you can kind of flow into that, so that's fine too. But I feel like I'm telling each time I teach, I'm telling a story, and so you know there's a beginning and there's a middle and then there's an end. And sometimes it just I'll be doing a particular posture, and normally something would flow. But something within me says this needs to happen now. And so I really, I trust in that. I don't at all get worried about what may or may not come up. It always seems to come out really well. And there's something very freeing about not having the, the limitation of, of the plan. I think as a new teacher, it's great to have a structure and a plan and then deviate as you need to. But I know, you know, a few weeks ago, I was doing a couple of rounds of sun salutations, which is not something I do a lot of, but I throw it in every now and again. And the plan was to go through twice. And we went through the first time and I did a check-in and everyone's going, no, nah, we're done. Once was enough. Okay, great. And so I, I was fine to then just move into something else and fill the gap quite comfortably. And it felt good to be really responsive to the group and, and move with that too. So yeah, I think some planning's great, but not so much that you can't move with the flow and to feel what's naturally coming through. The amount of times someone will come at the end of the class and, you know, that's exactly what I needed or... I really needed to hear it in that way too. And it can be interesting. Somebody will say, you know, I really needed to hear today about, you know, an open heart. And that wasn't really what I was saying, you know, or, or, but that's what they've heard and that's what they've received, which I've found really interesting that, you know, we really do hear and receive what's there for us, even if that wasn't exactly the intention of what was being delivered. It's interesting as well when we all have our phrases that we say a lot, like the things that we think are important. Yeah. And sometimes someone will come up after class and go, oh, that thing that you said today, it just really made so much sense. And in my head, I'm thinking, I feel like I say that every <laughs> yeah. class. Like, it's just that, that moment when that penny drops. Yeah, and they're absolutely. Like, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I know I was reading something recently about the quality of meditation and, and I'd never really thought about the quality of how you are in meditation. And I was sort of saying you know, there's, a, there's a gentleness to it so that when you're attending or, or that, that there's not a striving, there's not a harshness to it, but there's a, a softness mentally. And I thought, of course there is, but I've never really shared that or described that with my students before. And so I started talking a little bit around that language, presuming I'd led them in that direction just with other, other language or other words. But I don't know that I really had or not, not as clearly because exactly that happened. You know, a few people came to me through that week saying that that's made all the difference to my meditation now. I, I was working too hard. I was, I was concentrating too much. I was striving. And, and now that the softness is there, I can, it's, it's really landing in a different way. So I think sometimes what we say, we say over and over and it lands at the right time. And sometimes just the right thing comes through at the right time too. I think as well, sometimes it pays to say the thing that feels so obvious. It doesn't need to be said. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a powerful lesson for me. I thought, of course that's true, but it, it, it deserved some attention. I'm probably backtracking a bit. You're teaching at the studio that you 
you once practiced yeah. it. So obviously you have quite an attachment there. Were there any key teachers there that really helped draw you to keep you there? Definitely. So the studio was built and founded by Lynn Colenso. She received an inheritance from her aunt and decided that she wanted to build a studio. So that's just over 30 years ago. So it was purpose-built to be a yoga studio and, and nothing else. So it has a beautiful energy in it because it's really only had yoga and, and the creative dance as well. And so Lynn Colenso was, was definitely who I would describe as my true first teacher. And the word bahava or bhava is mood or attitude. And that's really what she conveyed through the teaching. So she wasn't big on, on alignment or a posture looking a particular way. It was, what does it bring to you? So when you're standing in your warrior, you know, how do you feel? And can you connect with a humility as the chin comes in? And it was, was all about the feeling that the postures bring. And she had the most beautiful, she'd decorate the room with you know, beautiful silk saris, and flowers and she would wear the most you know beautiful cotton clothing and scarves and she just brought so much life and color and creativity into the classes so lots of visuals and so that really informed how I've practiced and it, it really developed my love of the Bahaba style of yoga. Oh it sounds beautiful. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And I think, I think a lovely part of it is that it, it touches on, so it's, it's not just, you know, if we think of yoga as, say, you know, body, breath, heart, mind, but it's also, you know, connecting you to colour and, and imagery. And, you know, for some people, the doorway in is through, it might be colour, or it might be, it might be smell, or it might be you know, some other sense. So I think the more different avenues that you can open, the more possibility you're going to really invite somebody into a deeper experience. So I just felt that she opened more doorways, more possibilities for, for engagement. It's kind of interesting because now, say, functional anatomy and functional cueing and teaching for different styles of learning, which is some, it's something that's quite articulated now and something that people would do as a best practice kind of thing but it sounds like that's just something that just naturally flowed out of her that's just the way that she saw the world and that's just the way that she taught rather it being some kind of a protocol yeah well she was influenced by Dorothea Mangiamelli Dorothea was also responsible for bringing together the Mangala studio which is I think recently closed now in Carlton oh I have news Oh, okay, yeah. which was a bit sad. I haven't been to Mangala for a while, but so, you know, Dorothea had the dance background and which, so I think it's the, the dance that really, her background of the colour and the dance and the creativity then informed the yoga, which is why there's so much, I think, of the colour that came through in Lynn's teaching as a result of dancing and of working with Dorothea Mangiamelli. Well, actually, so tell me about Mangala. Yeah, I did inkbrush painting at Mangala from when I was like a little kid yeah. all the way up until... I went to art school basically, so over 10 years with Richard Lidicott there. Yep. And I did my inkbrush painting with Mia and she went on to form Travel Art Dance, which is a creative dance company. And so Mangala, they just weren't making it work yeah. with their business model. So all of the Mangala teachers are still teaching. They're teaching, I think, a Thornbury church. Yeah, okay. So those classes are still going. Sure. Richard's doing some inkbrush yeah, okay. classes there as well. And now Mia and Laura are turning Mangala into Green Monday Studio. So they're still doing the same style of creative dance there. They're wow. still doing a creative style of yoga sure. there. But they're bringing in lots of other yoga and dance classes as well. And Richard does an amazing unfolding of the self workshop which is a combination of ink brush painting and meditation and oh, wow. movement so that sounds wonderful yeah the mangala torch has just been carried on Yay. to a new generation <laughs> so yeah it's i guess it's, it's so evolved precious. rather than closed i know it's such a special place it really is and the teachings are just so precious and i think it is that accessing through different modalities and through different movement and through color and and music and, and I used to go to Peter Hockey's classes and he would all lie down and he'd be coming in and out, which I often thought was a bit odd as people because it was a bit of a flexible starting time. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between, say, nine and quarter past nine. And so you'd lie down and he'd, he'd be in and out and people would be coming in and out and he'd have this really loud, stirring music. And that just wasn't my experience of, of yes, music, Lynn would play music, but it was... 
it was there, but it, it wasn't the hero. It wasn't sort of drawing you too much into any particular direction. But this was bold and it was really evocative. And, you know, and then there'd be passing cars and reversing trucks. It's in Carlton. And I kind of always found it curious. And I don't know how settling it was, but thinking back on it later, I'm wondering if it just kind of met the busyness that you're mm. coming into the space in. So you've been navigating traffic or finding a car park or you know, it's in the middle of the day, whatever's going on, and it's just kind of meeting that busyness and then inviting you into the stillness. So I think it really had its place. I always found it curious, but that may be why. It's that thing as well of just being real, like not just coming in and assuming because you're in a yoga studio, everyone's ready to meditate, we'll yeah. all just drop into bliss, but yeah. instead acknowledging like, yep, it can be crazy out there yeah. in the world. Sometimes we bring that with us, <laughs> but, you know, we can evolve to a place where we are able to mm. kind of settle in and feel a bit more calm and a bit yeah. more still. Yeah. So now my gym class, well, my class down at Northcote Aquatic Centre, it seems that around, well, it's right next to the actual gym and the weights room. And I think around Shavasana time is when the some person decides to throw their weights down every <laughs> minute or so. But I actually feel like people still manage to get Makes you into a good that. meditator. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure absolutely. does. And sometimes I try and sort of, because, you know, there is a soundscape happening I like to bring that in as well and just allow people to let it wash over them it's always that thing as well where you're like has it been this noisy through the whole class but I've been yeah. doing so many other things <laughs> I haven't noticed it's only now that we're still I'm yeah. hearing all of this because life doesn't stop for us to meditate does yeah. it and and you know ideally if we can find whatever it is that we connect with in our meditation and actually bring that into all that we do that's life isn't mm. it that's mm. living from you know a wonderful place so it's lovely if we can have that stillness and quietness, but it's an opportunity to also practice when it's not. Hello, Ran here, just popping in to kindly request that you please subscribe to or review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. It helps other people discover us so we can share the stories and wisdom of incredible teachers to more and more people. Speaking of sharing, if you could share our episodes on social media, that would also help us out and you'd love to help us out, right? All right, that's more than enough from me. Let's get back to the conversation with Gabrielle. And I guess that leads us to your current practice because sure. you have dedicated yourself to a daily meditation practice and to documenting it as well. Can <laughs> <laughs> you tell us a little bit about that? So I've tried on and off to meditation is something that probably initially was the most challenging part of a yoga practice for me. And I think a lot of it was physical, just the physical sitting was uncomfortable. When the body's uncomfortable, it's difficult to connect to a quietness within. So I guess as my body got stronger, I felt more and more drawn to meditation. I've done some training in the IRS meditation, which really informs how I sit with my practice as well. And I just found I wanted to do my daily meditation and all kinds of stuff would come up. I'd do it for a bit and then I, I wouldn't and it was frustrating. And I'm not sure what made the difference, but I recently went on a seven-day IRS meditation retreat and part of my commitment was to do, in one of my meditations, I thought I need to commit and make myself accountable and the accountability is going to help me commit, I think. So I thought 108 days, why not? 108 days of consecutive meditation, no excuses. Previously, it'd be, oh, I won't do it on the weekend, just through the weekdays and oh, not if I'm on holidays. And I thought, no, it really needs to be a sustained practice every day. So I've um, set up a little Instagram account and really a handful of people following. And it's really not about building any kind of audience, but even if just one person's watching, it keeps me accountable. And it's been, it's been great. I've been documenting, I'm up to day 54, but I actually did a week before oh, that so when I was on exactly retreat. you halfway through. I am. How exciting. Yeah. I didn't notice that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been, it's actually been effortless. For some reason, something's switched and it's become an absolute priority and it's been fabulous. I, I started with 20 minutes and I thought I'll just very gradually build up. The aim initially at the beginning was to get to 40 minutes, but I'm not sure anymore whether, whether that feels right. So I worked up, I did 20 for a week or so, 25. Gradually they went up, went up by one minute to 30 and I've been sitting on 30 for a week or so and it's feeling like a really nice place to be. And I figure if it gets, if my little dinger goes off and I'm disappointed, 
then I'll extend it. But at the moment, I'm not waiting for it to go. So it still feels very comfortable, but I feel satisfied when it goes off. So yeah, it's been wonderful. Do you feel like, obviously, this was just the right time for you to begin this practice, but I'm wondering if you set up any other strategies in place for yourself that has made it easier to find time every day? I used to be, and still am to a degree, I, I get up and I tend to do a bit of a flick check my emails. I might do a bit of an Instagram check, a bit of a Facebook check. So I've I've consciously cut back that time. I know I need about an hour and a quarter from the time I start my meditation to be out the door. So I know what time I need to be out the door each day. And so I wind it back and I give myself an hour and a quarter. So if I wake up and I've got an hour before the hour and a quarter, that's playtime. And uh, it's been fine. I, I, I don't wake up with the alarm anymore. I just naturally wake up at six or half past six. And whenever my alarm goes off, then, then I do it. So I, have, I think having that structure has helped. But I really think the practice itself has helped because I'm enjoying it so much and getting so many fruits from doing it that it just is reinforcing And there's been a couple of times where the morning hasn't worked out and that's fine. I've just slotted it in the afternoon. I think once I did an evening one, which was a bit more of a sleep than a meditation. But yeah, I think it's eating itself has reinforced why I want to keep doing it. And the 108 days is really was just a target start. I'd really like to just do it every day. Back to when you fell asleep, because I do actually feel that if you really need to go to sleep, then that's what you should be doing. And it and that actually reminds me of, we've both been attending the Yoga Life Satsang with mm-hmm. Lee Blaschke and Janet Lowndes, and they've been awesome sessions and I've gained a lot of insights from everyone there, including yourself. And I particularly remember the last session was on not knowing and exploring ideas around that. And you said something about how wonderful it was, the liberation of of not knowing and not having to fit into a certain shape or just having that freedom. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I did some training with a yoga therapist, kinesiologist, her name's Susie Haightley. She's from Canada and it's all being done, you know, online and, and remotely. And she works predominantly her her main focus I think is getting people out of pain and she works with what she calls pure movement and so she has she said a lot of people where they have say limited movement in their shoulders or their hips they compensate and the compensation in itself is creating problems and if the body keeps compensating then wherever the movement is limited is never going to get better because the compensation's in place and so I've done a lot of work with her in pure movement And she works with principles of movement. So, you know, the first thing is begin with a sense of relaxation. Great place to begin, Mm -hmm. being relaxed. And the movement begins with the spine and then you radiate out to the larger joints and, you know, is the core part of what you're looking to do to be engaged. And then she talks about qualities like less is more and relaxed resilience, which is ease versus effort. And so as as a teacher, I like to encourage people to practice more with the principles than with specific alignment cues. And so it might be a case of, for example, if you're in a a mountain pose or downward facing dog, how does it feel to be in the pose and just take a little bit of effort out? And occasionally someone will say, where or how? I'm not going to tell you where or how. Just put it to yourself. How can I be a little bit more comfortable here? And for somebody, it might be relaxing their shoulders or or moving their neck. For somebody else, it might be, you know, softening the knees or just not pushing so much into the ground. So I think working with the principles helps people make the right choices for their body. And it really personalizes the practice. So then your instructions can really apply to everybody. You know, to say, which you, you'll really hear in my class, you know, tuck the tailbone under, which I think is a really poor cue generally. To tell everybody to tuck the tailbone under is just not appropriate. You're going to be getting people who are already in a neutral, healthy spine, creating tension and dysfunction somewhere else. So I really encourage people within you know, certain structures that I think are important and safe within the posture to then really drop in, connect in. Is there anything in my body that's not feeling right? Is there any discomfort in my joints? Is my breath flowing comfortably? Is there anything at all that is disturbing this sense of being here still and settled? 
and then making those kind of adjustments so that you can really be in the pose fully. And if I can look around the room and everybody is doing something a little different, I reckon it's landed and I'm I'm doing what I'm hoping to be doing. You know, everyone is practicing yoga with a sense of their body and what they bring to it. And so we can't all expect the shape to look the same. It just doesn't work. You know, a lot of people have this perception of yoga as being quite athletic and quite Mm. strong. And, you know, in many schools, it is quite athletic and strong. So when you have perhaps newer students coming to your studio that do have a strong athletic practice, how do you encourage them to soften, you know, I guess, relax? Yeah. As part of the teacher training program that I'm running at the studio, a couple of the girls who've come in this year have obviously come from a much stronger, more dynamic background. At the end of my practice, I'll often say, time to come down and and rest in Shavasana. Or if there's something that you really feel your body needs to feel satisfied or balanced or relaxed, enjoy that first and then when you're ready. And one particular lady I can think of, you know, went into this really strong binding twist. Binding doesn't happen in my class. It's not in my (laughs) vocabulary. But that was what her body was calling for. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I'm not going to say that's not right or wrong for you, but everyone else is is lying down or just, you know, maybe just a knee side to the side and she was going to full because we were on the ground. She had to come up and off she went into the spine. But after spending a little bit of time with me and really working again with those principles of inviting people, just try it on. Try it on. How does it feel to take five or 10% out of what you're doing? And then to see and hear what that brings to the practice is, I didn't realise the posture could feel this way. I didn't realise it didn't need to hurt. I didn't realise that my breath could still be flowing quite comfortably while I was holding what is, is a strong posture. So I think it's it's inviting people into trying a new way of, of practising and it's not going to land for everybody. It's not going to be right for everybody. And I will also say that, you know, I love to feel strong in my body. And I love to do a bit of weight training and I do a bit of Zumba and, you know, other things, other ways to build up my body and feel strong. But that's not really what I look for in yoga. And that really yoga is about helping to reduce the disturbances from the body, from the breath, from the mind, so that you can feel more settled and find the state of yoga. And so if you're, if you're pushing and forcing, you're actually moving in the opposite direction mm. and that's not yoga. So I think a lot of it is is educating people about what yoga is. And then you know, often we call yoga a group of practices, but yoga is a state. Mm-hmm. And so when we can get clear about what it is we're moving towards, you know, if we look to the, the wisdom texts and they'll tell us very clearly what yoga is and isn't. So if we come back to a sense that we're looking to settle and still, then is what you're is what you're inviting of your body now, is that creating a sense of settling or is the mind agitated? If the invitation to work with the breath is helping to steady you, great. If working with the breath is actually in some way distracting and disturbing, just breathe naturally. So I think it's just giving lots of options and choices and really inviting people, try it on. If it's feeling good, great. If it's not, let it go. And I think as well, especially when you first start practicing, sometimes that strong pose that demands your full attention and full focus can be one of the first times where you're like, oh, like I'm so present in this. Yeah. Like there's nowhere for my mind to go because no. I've, yeah. you know, like, and that is that first taste of like present moment awareness yeah. and yoga. And then over time as you practice more and that evolves it's like oh I can find this in a simpler pose yes. as well and I can feel some subtler details yeah. in this it's funny some people say oh your yoga is very gentle and sometimes I've, I kind of not that I take offense but I I wonder I should go yeah great it, it is but there's something in me as well that goes yes but and I think I I think sometimes there's a sense of gentle means you're not doing enough And I certainly offer stronger postures as well, with the instruction being that the muscles of the body can feel like they're working. That's how they get stronger and that's great. So if you can feel the muscles of your body working and there's no pain or discomfort in your joints, that's great, as long as you can keep breathing comfortably. And that's, again, yoga. So you can find the strength, but there's still ease in in the breath and ease in the mind. So it's always this this dance and balance between the, the stira and sukha, the ease and effort. So it's not all ease and it's not all effort. The strength might might come through the body and the ease might come through the, the mind or the strength might be to stay focused when the body's doing something very simple. 
So, you know, it can come in many different forms. And it takes a different type of strength to be able to stay steady as you very slowly flow through something. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. On a side note, I guess because, uh, you know, Joe teaches aerial yoga and I've been going to a few more of her classes recently and you find to begin with that because you're floating in space, your body just tends to, you know, whenever you move, you might be moving around, but over time you actually become more able to move parts of your body without going off in, in space. It's sort of really interesting. Sorry, it's a bit of a... No, no, I want to talk more about that as well because it's actually really rewarding for me as a teacher. Like I pretty much do the same warm-ups at the start mm-hmm. of every class and some of them are stability moves in the hammock. And to begin with, just that project of organising movement in a piece of fabric, like people's hammocks move all (laughs) over the place. And then I don't cue anything, but over time you can see how people's bodies get used to organising the movement in a way that isn't a lot of fabric movement. There's just all of these little micro stabilisation activations going on and that your hammock just magically stays more still. So it's like this really visual insight into what's happening in the body all the time as we're trying to stabilise our movements, but it's this really obvious feedback. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I, I think coming back to the principles of movement, I work a bit with core engagement and with stabilising in other parts of the body, but I love when you use principles rather than direct anatomical cues that people are finding their own way of their body organising itself, which is exactly that. So you're not saying draw in here or contract here or lift here, but a cue perhaps of keeping the spine quiet or keeping the torso steady while you're moving your arm or legs is engaging the core, engaging those stabilising muscles without you needing to think about recruit this or let go of that and empowering the person to find that structure within their own body, that we simply need to put the idea to our mind, mobilise here, stabilise here, and the body kind of works it out. That's pretty cool Mm -hmm. and much easier to organise than do this, this, this and this with different parts of your body. Which may be wrong for different people. Definitely, exactly. Especially talking about core and pelvic floor because a lot of people are walking around with a chronically tight pelvic floor and the symptoms are the same as someone who has a very loose pelvic floor Mm -hmm. and that even tuck the tailbone under yeah. if someone is already chronically tight through their exactly. pelvic floor that is just making that tense area more tense yeah. and so I've really been trying to think about cueing around that area yeah. of like I don't know I can't see everyone's pelvic no. floors so how do I talk about breath and how do I talk about stability in yeah. a way that is going to help everyone get to that place of responsiveness which yeah. is what we want from those muscles and those tissues yeah. no matter where they're coming in from absolutely i remember years back i did a meditation and it involved the pelvic floor and it was a picture of a it's been a while i think it was a downward facing like a gerbera or a daisy and so there was the the releasing of the pelvic floor as the petals opened and then a drawing up as the petals closed and so there was a releasing and a drawing up and one of the girls who had been doing teacher training at the time and she'd been pregnant through most of that said wow I think that's the first time my pelvic floor has released in a very long time and I don't think she realized she'd been holding tension in that area for so long and just didn't know and didn't know how to access it and what good timing before her birth absolutely (laughs) (laughs) absolutely yeah I've heard similar visualisation, but a jellyfish. Yeah. Oh. Although, like, what, what about all the tentacles? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> <the> visualisation. <laughs> Yoga and meditation really helped me and Joe through my cancer journey and I noted on your website, you you mentioned that yoga supported you through the death of your father, the raising of your teenage boys and the emotional rollercoaster of menopause. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could perhaps talk about that a little bit. Sure. I haven't updated my bio for a while, but I'm going to add one more thing to that. In 2012, my husband became very, very sick. He'd been sick for quite a while, undiagnosed. I think they thought he had leukemia. They did all kinds of tests and he lost 20 kilos. He had night sweats. He dragged himself to work every day I don't know how and then collapsed at the end but anyway long story short he he got diagnosed with myocarditis 
and he ended up with uh, brain aneurysms and aneurysms in his forearm. He lost most of his spleen. He was in hospital for three months in both neurology and cardiology. And yeah, he was touch and go for a very long time. One of very few people who've survived the systemic infection that he had. So yeah, at that, that time too, I was two young boys managing a studio, seeing him every day. So through all of those things, and everyone's life has these things that come come and go. Yoga for me was a way of coming right back into centre. And because I was teaching a group of people, you need to be fully there for them. So it was a wonderful escape from me, I think. It was a wonderful moment just to let go of all the the things that were going on, to really come into my centre. And the way I teach is I'm practising as the group are practising. You know, I occasionally get up and walk around, but essentially I'm doing what you're doing and I drop in and as part of me dropping in, I'm really accessing appropriate cues to, to engage, to deepen someone's experience And I've just found that dropping in really brings the mind in, helps me come into that yogic state. And then all the stuff is still there. The husband is not well, dad is dying, the ups and downs of of having kids. But it gives you that moment of resetting. And then you can go back in and and face whatever's there from that, that little holiday from yourself, really. And that, that sense, the more that I've dropped into my own practice. It also has enabled me to be more available and present to whoever's there for me. I know when my nana died a couple of years ago, I, she only had a day or two to go and mum really wanted me to go and see her and I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say, what to do. And I think I read something from the Tibetan book of living and dying. I just kind of flicked to try and find something helpful. And, and what I got from it was I really just need to turn up and be there. I, th- I can I can do that. Like that's something I can do really well. I'm really good at just being. I can hold space and and sit with somebody. That's something I can really do. And so I did and I just I just sat with her and I enabled whatever to unfold to unfold and that's just such a gift from from yoga. It's been an absolute rock for me. A real place of coming in, tuning off, but in a way that I can then come back with a freshness and a lightness and and perhaps clarity too, depending on what's going on. I had a really similar experience Mm. when Ran was unwell. Like teaching for me was a really great breathing space in that. And as you're saying, being present for other people, Mm -hmm. being in the flow of the movement. And absolutely, we want to be present in all moments of Mm -hmm. life. But I think when someone that you love has a serious illness, like your mind is always going to the future and you don't know what that future holds. So that very conscious grounding into the present moment, it's like it just recharges your batteries a little bit to kind of go back out and be a bit more present in the everyday moment of the rest of life. Yeah. Yeah, our nervous system needs to reset. So if we're kind of operating a particular level, even if it drops down a bit, it's going to come up again, you know, depending on what's going on. But we're coming back up from a from a place that's dropped a little. Otherwise, we're just going to keep going and going and going. So you know, there's certainly moments where things were very challenging, where I wasn't in a headspace to teach. And then it's appropriate to step out. I don't want to be struggling in a space when I'm responsible for holding a space. I don't think that's fair. And, you know, I've needed to step back and say, now's not the right time to teach or now's not the time to sit with somebody one-on-one because my space is a bit clouded and I really need to be open for that. So, you know, there's wisdom in that too, to know that this is a great opportunity to sort of step out, step into something and come back or maybe for a while I step out altogether. And so were there other practices that really helped you through those times? I think a lot of it was... A lot of people stepped in, particularly with my husband, to help, to look after the boys, you know, they were sort of 15, 16, cook. And so I think there was a real sense of, because part of me is like, I can manage all of this. I can do it. These are my boys. I can still go in hospital, see Andrew, do my yoga classes, do the cooking, pick up, you know, I can be the superwoman. And at some point I said, you know what, you don't have to be the superwoman. It's okay to let other people come and help and other people are really happy to help. So I I think it was a real sense of letting go and allowing others to step in and and then the graciousness and gratefulness for for that. And it's just like you tell your students, could I do 10% less and (laughs) enjoy it more? Absolutely, absolutely. And I have found more and more, and I think it is a flow on from the meditation, that I'm just creating more and more space 
you know, put on my emails, I only answer my emails up till 4 p.m. And I pretty much stick to that. You know, I don't, I used to work into the evenings, I used to work into the weekends and there's always something to do. And I, and I was just always trying to keep up with it. And then my expectation would be other people need to be responding really quickly too, because that's what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> I'm looking at it all the time. And so then you have these, these, these expectations you're pushing on other people. And I think a lot of it's flowed from, from the meditation but I think if I wind it even further back, my husband and I were fortunate a couple of years back to do about half the Camino walk. And we had a month of not much, just carrying what we had on our back. So really limited. And it was just fabulous. And you know, as I'm walking, because you've got a lot of time just to be walking and thinking and being with yourself, and uh, which again, the yoga prepared me beautifully for, I'm just ticking off, I can let that go. I can let that go. And just this sense of when you lighten the load, and you, you really feel into what that feels like, I'm getting much better at doing that. And not just saying that's enough, just is there still more space? So I'm loving the meditation space and then creating more space in my life too. Yeah. I hear people say this about minimising their belongings and clearing yeah. out their houses <laughs> as well. Like once you start doing it and there's yeah. this extra space, you just want to do it more. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm looking forward to how that unfolds and what that looks like. And it feels exciting rather than feeling like a burden. I think space creates space. Well, it gives you perspective yeah, as well. Definitely. And definitely as a studio owner myself, yeah. it's like you train people how to communicate with you. So if you're answering your emails at like 10 o'clock yes. on Sunday night, you're telling people that you're available then Absolutely. and it's totally fine for them to message you then. Absolutely. It's like, you know, other businesses have business hours. Yeah. Yeah. If you emailed another business, like they wouldn't even be open on no, the weekend. No. Also, often as a yoga teacher, you're almost balancing that fine line between friend and... Yes. Yeah, I'm struggling to find the word, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, people do become your friends, mm. Mm. but also they're people who come to your work. So mm. there's, there's that, like, I think all of that goes better if you do have some clear boundaries in mind for yourself as yeah. what's work time and what's play time and what's practice time. Absolutely. And I'm 100% in the process of <laughs> always trying to get to that place. Yeah. I think as well for me what's helpful to think about as well because you don't want to feel like you're failing at life because you don't feel like you have balance. Yeah. So it will always be this process of different seasons of different things. Like you might have a patch where you get a lot of work done and you're really excited about building some aspect of your business. And then you might walk the Camino and yeah. like not do a single business thing for yeah. a month or just have family time and just shutting down or acknowledging, but yeah. not being ruled by that part of your brain that's always feeling guilty about not doing something mm. is such a powerful practice. It really is because there's there's always going to be something to do so I'm getting better too at and this was one thing I this uh, Susie Haightley who I did the work with years ago for anatomy I uh, also did a 12-month mental program with her you know basically being a yogi and running a business and one of her key things was plan each day before it begins another one was the accountability which has been helpful plan each day before it begins read and write your goals every day and be accountable and so I try you know each day to just kind of write you know, maybe two or three things that I want to get done for the next day and things that will create more space for me so I can mentally tick it off and know that it's done. And even though there's always going to be a pile of other stuff to get done, I give myself probably about an hour when I get home of that needs to be done after teaching. And then I'm spending more time cooking and preparing food and other things and there's more balance there's definitely more balance. And so I'm still getting a sense of accomplishment of what really needs to be done today is being met. And then, you know, more space to bring out the other aspects of who I am. We're reaching the end of our conversation. <laughs> <Blue by. laughs> it really did, didn't it? Um, so if you could distill everything you've learned, everything you teach down to one core lesson, what mm. do you think that one thing would be? <laughs> or what's speaking to you right now? Look, I, I, I really think it's, it's to slow down. Because when you, when you slow down or stop or, or take a moment and, you know, let's say in terms of a yoga practice, then you have that opportunity to, to look inwardly and to then make a wise decision as to is, is the call to, to do less, is the call to do more, uh, is it to modify? We can then, when we, when we slow down, when we make space and we listen, we learn to respond rather than react and that that slowing down gives us space 
And so when we're responding, we're working in harmony with ourselves and we're more in harmony with life. And I've found that to be true over and over again, just creating this, this space around circumstance and you, you know, as, the, as the observer and as the witness and then going, okay, what's going to bring me towards who I want to be or where I'm going and what's a wise choice for me? And it's always there. We just need to tune in and listen and we need, we need to stop for that to happen. So I'd say slowing down. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. I think it's given me a lot to think about. And as I mentioned before the interview, I'm going to cover a yoga class tonight and I think I've got lots of things I want to try out there. Yeah, so cool. thank you again so very much. My pleasure. And that was our conversation with Gabrielle Boswell. She's given me a lot to think about, both in my own practice and teaching, and so I asked the question to you. Is there anything you found useful from this episode that you might use in your own classes? Did anything else resonate with you? We would love to hear from you. You can comment on our website, podcast.flowartist.com, or join the conversation on our Facebook group, the Flow Artist Podcast Community. All right, we have another episode coming up before we head over to Japan for two weeks, and it's an interview with Emily May. Emily May is a Melbourne-based yoga teacher, and this episode is a conversation on yoga and anxiety, which will be released just before Are You OK Day on the 12th of September. So look out for that one next week. It's really important. Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I would like to honour the elders of the wisdom traditions we share, as well as the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where this podcast is recorded in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you so, so much for listening. Joe and I really appreciate it. Aroha nui. Big, big love.